you know, as we think about our church and you see some banners on the wall that's in front of all the leaks that are uh, showing themselves strong too, um, you see really the vision of our church. The, the vision of our church is threefold. One is to exalt the Lord. That should really be the first and foremost uh, aspect of our lives, that we put Him first in everything that we do. That we are to equip the saints, that God's given us a work to, to train up um, one another. We're, we're, we're in a one another ministry. We're here to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. It's not, it's not for the pastor to do the work of the ministry. It's for the church to do the work of the ministry. You know, and, and therefore God calls those that would help to equip each one of us to do that work. And then it's to extend the kingdom. And so we're, we're looking at the ideas of, you know, proclaiming the gospel to, to make it known to those around us. And so the, the first part of that vision deals with our vertical relationship to the Lord. The other two begin to deal with the horizontal aspects of, of that relationship. You could say, you know, loving the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then also loving your neighbor as, as yourself. And so we see that sort of unfold in that way. And, and we could think of this also as connecting people to God, connecting people to one another, and then connecting people to the, the city or connecting people to those, uh, the culture around us. And for the past four weeks we've been uh, spending some time dealing with this idea of the church that is called to seek the welfare of the community, the, 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 the city in which we're a part of. And, and we've looked at four aspects uh, where we've exhorted us in, in the fact that we should be about prayer. These are all peace, Pat. Um, just, just to remind you, um, you know, that, that we're called to pray. And, and oftentimes our prayer can really be inward. It could be self-centered, but our prayer needs to encompass uh, something greater than ourselves. It, it needs to encompass, you know, those around us. And, and, and not even just the church and the church family, but, but the city that we live in, the, the country that we live in, the, the world that we, we live in, that, that our prayers need to, to expand in a, in a greater dimension. We, we also talked about presence and how you know, we are all called to make a difference, that, that we're to be present among other people. It's, you know, how, how, do you, how do you love someone unless you're ever present with them. You know, and so God calls us to be salt and light in our community. And that means visibly living with other people. Uh, you know, they're, they're, we touch them. We, we, we speak with them. We're, we're, we're practicing. We're, 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 we're in presence. And then we talked about a third P of practice. Because how we live says a lot about what we believe, doesn't it? You know, if you believe one thing and you live a different thing, people call that hypocrisy. You know, but, but if, if we're living what we believe, there's integrity in that. And, and that's what God calls us to practice what we preach. Which is the fourth P, is the proclamation, because we still need to preach. We, we still need to share the love of God. You know, that if all we do is good, do good things, and we're practicing the things of the kingdom, but we never preach, then we're just nice people. But, but we never actually give the truth of what's necessary to, to allow somebody uh, um, to, to come to a place of, of a commitment to the Lord. You know, and this is a sort of a, a battle that I've been thinking through a little bit because, you know, it's like even uh, we've been involved with the overflow shelter, and, and many of you probably don't know, but there was one of the individuals that um, and had begun to be part of the overflow um, that passed away this week. And, and so... You know, for them, it's it's a family. Um, people are together, and so you say, okay, if all we did is provided a nice place, we we did nice things. But if we've never communicated Christ, then there's a piece that's been missing. You understand? We we could be all involved with with social aspects, but we also need to be involved in sharing the testimony of who Jesus Christ is. And so, when I begin to think about this, you know, in 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 the West. There's sort of two ministry concerns that we have. Um, it, and what I want to focus on today is sort of this idea of uh, ministries of justice and mercy, you know, looking at both of these things. But, but in the Western world, we, we tend to emphasize word or deed. I want to make a distinction with that. Either we're proclaiming the word or we're, we're focusing on the deeds or the doing that we're, we're to do. And, and uh, you know, the, the, the proclamation of the gospel or the service of the gospel. 
And, and somehow these two things have split off in almost like rival political and denominational factions for, for almost a hundred years. We, we can look at one area of being cons what we consider like a conservative ministry and, and, and that would stress the importance of personal morality and, and it proves uh, the calling of people to conversion to evangelism and the preaching of the gospel. So here's, here's sort of the, the conservative model. And, and then we can also look at more of a liberal model that stresses social justice. But it rejects this overt call to convert other people. And yet Jesus called his disciples to a gospel messaging, which is to urge everyone to repent and believe the gospel. But he also called people to gospel neighboring, which is sacrificially meeting the needs of those around us, whether they believe or not. There's two aspects here that he brings together. These two concerns need to go together. And let me tell you why. The, the, the first thing is that word and deed go together theologically. The, the resurrection of Jesus shows us that God not only created both body and spirit, but that he will redeem body and spirit. Amen. He's come for the whole you. You know, and, and that's the nice thing about the resurrection is that, you know, what, what was sowed in corruption now is going to be raised incorruptible. You know, that God is coming, and, and the work that He began in you, He will complete until the day of Christ Jesus. You know, there, there's a, a full uh, um, redemption that takes place. And so, salvation that Jesus will eventually bring us into this fullness includes a liberation of not only the, 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 the spiritual effects, but also the physical and material effects in our lives. Jesus came both preaching the Word and healing and feeding. There, there, there's a, two aspects of what we see. And so the, the, the final kingdom of God is really justice for all. And so as Christians, we can faithfully proclaim the gospel through both words and deeds of compassion and justice. Serving the material needs of people around us, but at the same time calling them to faith in Jesus Christ. So, word and deed go together theologically, but they also go together practically. Because in some ways, you know, you, you, when you're doing gospel neighboring, loving your neighbor, you're also doing gospel messaging. Loving deeds of service to someone, regardless of their race or faith, are always an attractive testimony to the truth and motivation and the power of the gospel. And the church's ministry to the poor, it, it makes great sense in terms of the corporate witness to the community of Christ's transforming love. And, it, and it's important, you know, it, it's, it's a plausible structure for the preaching of the gospel. But, but we need to preach the gospel. When, when we look at this idea of the foundations of ministries of mercy and, and justice, we want to examine in a greater depth the, the theological foundation of this type of ministry. And I, I want to look at three primary biblical concepts. The first one is neighbor, the second one is service, and the third one is justice. Because the Bible calls us as Christians we are to love our neighbors. And it's uh, typical to think of, of our neighbors as people that are the same social class and means, but we, we, we find something different. You know, that, that was the thinking in Luke chapter 14, is people like me. But the Old Testament calls Israel to recognize the immigrant in Leviticus 19.34, to recognize the immigrant, the single parent family, and the poor as our neighbors. Even if they come from another nation. Even if they come from a different race. And in Luke chapter 10, verse 25 to 37, Jesus takes us even further. He says, your neighbor is anyone you come into contact with whom lacks resources. Even someone that comes from a, a hated race or another religious faith. You know, you know the story of the, the Good Samaritan, right? <laughs> So our responsibility to neighbors includes love and justice, two things that, that seem to link 
together closely because in Leviticus 19.18 when the God says this, He says, Love your neighbor as yourself. But He also commands us as we look at verse 13 to 17 not to defraud, not to pervert justice, not to show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great or do anything to endanger our neighbor's life. So there, there's something more of definition here when we look about how it means to love our neighbor. Therefore, according to Jesus, God is a God of justice. Amen. And anyone who has a relationship with Him needs to be concerned about justice as well. So we look first at this idea that, that we are to love our neighbors. The second thing is we're called to serve. And this Greek word is the Greek word that we always pull off all of these variations, but it's the word we've come to know as deacon in, in the New Testament. But diakonio notes this, it's a humbly providing for the most basic and simple needs through deeds. That's pretty easy to understand, right? You're a servant is one who humbly provides for the most basic and simple needs through deeds. And the root meaning is the word that we get to feed someone by waiting at a table. Luke gives the example of Martha in, in Luke uh, 10 40, preparing a meal for Jesus. She was serving him. She was simply meeting that need. A group of women disciples followed Jesus and the apostles and they provided food and other physical needs. This ministry is called Dekanoia. Again, in, in Matthew 27 55 and in Luke 8 3. You, you know, we, we had a men's meeting uh, this week and, and you know, some of the ladies. Graciously, we, we didn't ask for this. I, you know, if it was up to me, I probably was going to buy pizza or something. You know, but, but, but the ladies came and said, can we make something for the men's ministry? And, you know, gee, we had lasagna and fried chicken and deviled eggs and uh, salad and uh, brownies and, you, you know, eclairs. Um, I think the men said they want to meet more often. Um, that we, men... But what a, what a beautiful, and, and the thing was, it was, it was just something that they asked to serve. It wasn't anything asked, but, but thank you ladies for, for what a beautiful expression of, of love to us. You know, in the, in the upper room, Jesus said in Luke twenty two twenty seven, 27, Who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? You know, the, the, in Acts 6, 2, the work of providing daily necessities for the widows in the early church was also referred to as this de dekanoia. You know, so the, the question is remarkable because the value system of the culture of the day was that serving others was considered demeaning work. And against this backdrop, what Jesus is saying, he's making this, this startling statement that Christian greatness is the polar opposite of the values of this world. Because he says, I'm among you, in Luke 22, 27, as one who serves. So he was one that was willing to serve, and he said, you know what, here is your role model. Uh, you, you, you're called to be a busboy, uh, you know, the, to serve others, to, to meet these needs. So, so the Lord is saying that, you know, we are called to love our neighbors, and how we love our neighbors, one of the ways we do this is to serve, and, and basically we're serving to meeting specific needs of, of whatever someone else has that we might be able to give. And so we see this as a, this Christian pat, pattern of greatness is directly follows the pattern of Christ's work in the church. And so our acts of service for others are the evidence that God's love is an operation in our own lives. In, in 1 John 3, verse 17 and 18, John writes, Whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shoves up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So, so God is calling us, first, that we are called to love our neighbor, and we do this through service, but also, this third point is that we're instructed to do justice, or, or to live justly. 
And, you know, we, we're familiar with the scripture in Micah 6, 8. And, and many times as evangelicals, we, we tend to translate the, this verse as living righteously. Just sort of generally means a, a broad understanding of Christian obedience to the word of God. Uh, and, and, and somehow committing ourselves to not commit these, you know, egregious sins. And this understanding, though, is inadequate, <laughs> especially when we study the term justice, when we look at what it means in the Old Testament. What, what does the Bible actually say about justice? You know, there, there was a scholar by the name of Bruce Waltke, and he defined justice in this way. I, I shared this recently in, in one of the posts that I wrote. But here's his actual quote. He says, The righteous are willing to disadvantage themselves to advantage the community. And the wicked are willing to disadvantage the community to advantage themselves. Just let that sink in for a minute. The righteous are willing to disadvantage themselves to advantage the community. You're willing to take a step down for yourself so that you can help somebody take a step up. But the wicked are willing to disadvantage the community to advantage themselves. I'm going to put you down so I can get up. Most people think of wickedness as, as just, you know, disobeying the Ten Commandments, uh, breaking the law, uh, lying, committing adultery. And these are all wicked, of course. But, but lying and adultery are best understood as the, the tip of the iceberg of wickedness. It's what you're visibly seeing, but there's something that's underneath the surface. And if you know anything about icebergs, the majority of the ice that you see on the top is much greater and vast underneath the water. Under the surface, it's less visible, but it's no less wicked. Like, like just give some, some for instance, like, like not helping to feed a poor person when you have the power to do so. Or, or taking so much income out of your business that you owe it to the employees that you're paying poorly. Or, or you, maybe you're just shoveling the snow in your own driveway without ever thinking about doing the same thing for the elderly neighbor that's near you. I, I hear a couple of stories of... Uh, you know, Jimmy goes all the way down the street with his little machine, and I know Timmy's doing the same thing. You know, so that's a great testimony that we're, we're able to help those around us. You know, all of these ways are what we're disadvantaging ourselves by advantaging others. We're willing to take a step in doing something, you know, that, that you're, you're willing to moderate your life so that you can help somebody else's life. You know, you're willing to make a, a sacrifice so that someone else can get a leg up. Does it make sense? You know that we're doing that. And the thing is that when you have the opportunity to do it, but you don't do that, then it's wickedness. There's something underneath the surface that's not allowing you to take that step. And when you understand this, we begin to see that justice is an everyday activity. It's not to be only something that you do in court. It's not something you just do with legislation. In other words, living justly means I'm living with a constant recognition of the claims of the community on me. Or on us. Amen? It means that we're disadvantaging ourselves in order to advantage others. You know, Jesus said, I don't want you to lead from the top down. I want you to lead from the bottom up. I want you to be a servant. A servant takes a step down. Amen? You know, we've talked about that in our own leadership team. You know, if you want to be a leader, you need to take a step down. There's going to be a disadvantage to yourself. Amen. It's not an advantage. This work has to work out itself in every area of our life. It has to work out in our family. Are we disadvantaging ourselves so our family can be advantaged? It has to work out in our sexual relationships. Are we disadvantaging ourselves so that someone else can, can have the advantage? How about our jobs, our vocations? How we use our money? How we use our possessions? How, how we walk as a citizen? How we pursue our leisure? All of these things. How, how we seek and use corporate profits? How we communicate and present ourselves? How, how we form and, and, and conduct our own friendships. 
Uh, are we willing to disadvantage ourselves so that we can advantage someone else? Are you willing to give? You know, do you come to church here so that you can get something? Or are you coming to church so that you can give something? See, this to me means going way beyond what's legally required of us. You, you know, like, oh, okay, well, I did this. I crossed the T. I, you know, I, I, I dotted the I. And, and you know, I, I'm basically, you know, when, when your kids ask you something, you know that they're trying to do is just trying to find out what, what do I, what's the least common denominator of what I have to do? And then I can just do whatever I want to after that. But we're not saying this. It's saying like everything in my life has to come under this idea that if I'm going to live justly, I have to look at every area of my life thinking, how am I disadvantaged? Advantaging myself to advantage someone else. A CEO who's willing to say, as Job said, Job, Job said in Job 29, 14, justice was my robe. You, 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 if it's your robe, you can't be thinking just of your shareholder's profit. You also have to think about the good of your employees. You got to think about the community in which the business operates. There's something more than just the bottom line. There are many things that managers and banks can legally do, but according to the Bible, it's unjust. The Old Testament makes it clear that God's justice means that we share food, that we shelter, that we offer basic resources for those who have smaller amounts than us. You, you can look at Isaiah 58, uh, 6 to 10. I'm sorry I'm skipping through and just giving you references this morning, but I'm trying to get a, a, a sort of a big picture idea that I can help to, to break a little bit more in the future. The, the Bible speaks about acts that meet basic human needs. They're not just called acts of mercy. It implies compassion for the undeserving, but they are also considered acts of justice, which means giving people their due. And, and you know, I'll be honest with you, I've been wrestling with these two things. Because I think I'm more, I think I've leaned more on the conservative side than I have on the liberal side. But in doing so, you know, I might be looking at things a certain way and I might be offering mercy, but I'm not necessarily thinking about justice. We don't all start with the same thing in life. We, we don't all have the same privilege. We don't have all the same assets. As, as I've walked in, in my walk for a long time, you know, I look at other people and it's easy to sometimes be critical, but you've got to look back and say, man, if I had that foundation, if I had that setting, if I had that instruction as a young person, where would I be today? Look at some inner city children and through no fault of their own, you know, they might have been growing up in an environment that was extremely detrimental to their learning. And you may argue the fact that, you know, that who is primarily at fault in this situation. Some people blame the parents, other people blame the culture, some it's the government, you know, it's big business, it's systematic uh, racism, and the list goes on and on and on. But, but no one argues that it was the child's fault that they were in this situation. Everyone can recognize, as far as the children are concerned, their plight is part of a deep injustice in this world, one that is affected because of the fall. And, and their duty, that we're duty bound to somehow improve. It's one thing to try to help remedy injustice, but it's another thing to think about it wisely. You know, one of the main reasons this is especially difficult is the, the unbalanced political ideologies and the unbiblical reductionism that, that reign in our culture today. You know, because many conservatives are motivated to help the poor solely out of a disposition of mercy. A, a motivation perhaps rooted in the belief that poverty is almost solely a matter of individual responsibility. They say this, I, I just want you to be thinking in your own mind, you think like this. The attitude sometimes, it overlooks the fact that the haves are in a position to a great degree because of the uneven distribution of opportunity and resources at birth. <laughs> Can, can you agree? I mean, while we all have this potential, we didn't all, we weren't all born with the same 
opportunity. And as Christians, we know that every material blessing that we do have is a gift from God. And if we fail to share the material benefits we have been given, or we're impatient and harsh with the poor, then, then we're not just guilty of a lack of mercy, we are guilty of injustice. On the other hand, many liberals are motivated to help the poor out of a sense of indignation over aborted justice. And they miss an important truth as well, namely that the individual responsibility does have a great deal to do with helping people escape this cycle of poverty. There's two pieces here. There's a part, there is a responsibility involved here, and also it's a, a, a reality of knowing that not everybody has the same assets to begin with. So conservatives may uh, advocate a compassionate, responsibility-based solutions that can become paternalistic and, and even patronizing and, and blind to many of the social, socio-cultural factors contributing to the problems of poverty. And, and the liberals, their orientation against systematic injustice can lead to anger, rancor, and division, and we see this happening in our nation. Can I say this, that both views become self-righteous? One blames the poor for everything. The other one blames the rich for everything. One approach overemphasizes individual responsibility. The other one underemphasizes individual responsibility. But we're Christians. And we're called to live justly as a response to God's grace. And at first glance, it, it doesn't seem logical that Christ's salvation, which is of sheer grace, should move us to do justice. But, but that's what the Bible says it should. You know, in the Old Testament, God tells the Israelites this in, in Leviticus 19.34, The alien living among you must be treated as one of your native born. Love him as yourself, for you were aliens in Egypt, and I am the Lord your God. He's saying here that the Israelites had been foreigners. They had been oppressed slaves in Egypt. And now they did not have the ability to free themselves, but God liberated them by His own grace and power. You read in the Old Testament, it says, I carried you on eagle's wings. See, there was, a, there was a grace of God, there was a freedom of God that released them out of bondage. And now, he says, as a result of your own freedom, as a result of the fact that you've been liberated, you need to treat all people who have less power or fewer assets as your neighbor. Demonstrate to them love, justice, do this to them. So the theological and the motivational basis for doing justice is salvation by grace. That God has saved us. That He has freed us. That He has wiped away our sin. He's done something for us that we weren't able to do for ourselves. And therefore, as we begin to operate with other people, we have to understand the same aspect. It's only by God's grace that we can minister. In James 2.14, it says, the writer says this, that, that while we are saved by faith and not works, real faith in Christ will lead us to deeds of service. And, and then he, he begins to show us what these deeds look like in, in James 2, verse 15 to 17. He says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed but does nothing about his physical need, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by actions, is dead. And you can read the entire book of James and, and, and see, you know, the, the reasoning that God is showing in the book of James, and, and it directly relates to the same thing that you find in Leviticus 19. You know, a desire to help poor arises from a heart that's touched by grace. 
a heart that has surrendered its feelings of superiority to any particular class of people. I think that's the thing. And you know, I, I've been really blessed by how many people in the church have responded when we when we are able to open up the overflow shelter and begin to walk with people. And you know, the, the testimony is coming back. You know, they, they're just people like we are. Amen. Amen. Might be going through a difficult situation. How many of us have been through a difficult situation? Some of us can look back and say, man, if things were a little bit different, I could have been in that place. I don't have enough time to kind of continue, but let me let me just raise three particular points here that you know, once we understand that why, as a church, we should participate in ministries of mercy and justice. And see, so we'll combine those things. If all I'm doing is pitying people, you know, then, then I'm looking as someone that's a superior to someone that's an inferior. Do you understand? If I want to do something that's just, I, I need to be able to bring myself down to be able to help them come up. There, there, there's something that's different here. So, you know, we, we, we can think about what we should do, but let me just say there's at least three different things that we need to be involved in. The first one is relief. Relief is kind of just simply what it is. It's giving direct aid to meet physical, material, and social needs. You know, the, that, that, that's part of what we had to do. Uh, you know, some of the things we're doing here, whether it's temporary shelter for the homeless, food or clothing, services that people might need, you know, whether it's a ride or, or getting some, you know, getting to a medical appointment or medical services, crisis counseling, uh, you know, all of these things, it, it's a form of relief, it's a direct advocate to which people in need, they're given assistance to, whether it's legal aid, uh, finding housing, um, getting a job, you know, these are the kind of things that we'd be in, in, uh, involved in. But, you know, we, when we combine them with other types of assistance, then if all we're doing is bringing relief, and we bring relief, and we bring relief, now we can create dependency. So we have relief, which is something that's meant to really try to help somebody come up. But then the second thing is this, is development. You know, we need to be, while it's necessary to give relief, it's also important that we can bring the person in our community to a place of self-sufficiency. To be able to be able to support themselves, to be able to take a step out. That while they're in a particular need, we're helping them get established to do something. In the, in the Old Testament, when a, debt, when a slave's debt was erased and he was released, God, here's what God directed the former master uh, for him. He had to send him out with grain, with tools and resources for a new self-sufficient economic life. You want to see that? Look at Deuteronomy 15, verse 13 to 14. So what's he saying here? Okay, now I've helped him out. Okay, I put you in my house or whatever. Now I'm going to send you out. But I didn't give you food. I didn't give you skills. I didn't give you... Opportunities. In other words, there, there's a walk that we have to do. And so we need to be involved in relief, but we also have to be involved in development, right? You know, that's, that's the idea of coming to Christ is that He teaches us. And so we don't need to stay in the position that we are. We come in stuck. He, he, he frees us, but we can get unstuck. Amen? Amen. And the third, the third area is reform. You know, that's, that's where we, we, we move beyond in other areas where we begin to look at areas in our culture that need to be addressed. You know, um, we go from just meeting immediate needs and uh, getting people out of dependency, but now we're looking at trying to change the social systems of injustice that can cause that dependency. And this is a, this is a bigger job than, uh, than, than we can all obviously do alone. Uh, in Job 29, 17, he declared that he was not only clothed, not only did he clothe the naked, but he broke the fangs of the wicked and snatched the victims from his teeth. You know, you, you, you look at this idea. And, and so Moses communicated God's stance, uh, stance against legal systems that weighed in favor of the rich and the influential. You know, systems of lending capital that, that gouged people. 
that had just modest means. You know, the prophets denounced unfair wages and corrupt business practices. Daniel called a, a pagan government to account for its lack of mercy to the poor. You know, we, we see many different examples where there, there's also a, a, a system problem that we have to deal with that, that we need to be able to change. So as we look at, at the Bible, it's saying here that we as people you need to just have mercy. We have actually, it's justice that we have to look for. You know, and God's calling us to, to, to love our neighbor. He, he's calling us to, to serve our neighbor. And, and we're looking at these areas of, there's a relief that we need to bring. But there's also a development that needs to take place. And in the process, God wants us to do what we can do to bring reformation to what's taking place in our land. I'm, I'm going to leave it at that for this week because we're going to take communion now. But, you know, we, we could get all on all these social programs. I really miss the mock because, you know, the real issue is this, is that when a person gets introduced to Jesus Christ, his life changes forever. And so we should never do one without doing the other. That, that would be losing opportunity. Because ultimately, whether I have all the food I could ever have in my house, and I can have all of these things, if I don't have Christ, then I remain poor. I remain broken. Yeah. And so we, we need to continue to walk in a balanced way. I pray God continue to give us opportunity. Because as we serve, He changes our hearts as much as the people that we help. But in doing so, let us also not lose the fact of why we're doing what we're doing. We're called to love our neighbor, but we're also called to do justice and to introduce them to Jesus Christ. Amen? Because in Him is all glory. In Him is all knowledge. In Him is all ability. And only He can break all of the habits that we have and, and to deal with the injustices that we've been oh, gone through and, and to enable us to be able to be forgiven and to forgive others in Christ alone. Amen. Lord, thank you for this day. And as we continue to consider all that you're doing, Lord, we, we just want to bless you and, and, and glorify you and ask you, Lord, as we prepare for our communion. You can pass the communion element out. As we prepare for our communion, Lord, that, that you'd have a search at our own hearts. And Lord, help us to, to do what you've called us to do. To love as you've called us to love. To disadvantage ourselves. To advantage others. For that's really all that you've asked us to do. To love. Mercy. To walk. Humbly. To do justly. We glorify you and thank you Lord. In Jesus name. Amen.